Sunday, he stood in the pulpit before a large audience to preach what was going to be his final sermon uh, on, on his way out into the seventh package that was agreed upon, and, and he, was, he was going to be done at that moment. And this church is an old church, it's a stately church, and had at that time an elevated, partially enclosed pulpit where you walk up into it, kind of kind of an old church, so it kind of would kind of up and out over the over the, the platform. Um, and, uh, and and above the pulpit, it's kind of stood way up here, uh, was uh, a, a very old elegant chandelier that came down to a point in which set a very large light bulb that shone down on the pole. And the, the pastor preached his final sermon, neither affirming nor denying the allegations. And when he stopped preaching, the moment he stopped preaching, the large light bulb hanging uh, above the pulpit detached and fell and shattered right there at the pole. And to those and the rest experienced this. So it was very weird, very strange thing that caught everybody's attention. Now one more story, and then I'm going to try to make a point and move us into the passage at hand. I had a professor in seminary, I won't tell you his name, that uh, he was also a pastor for years on years, uh, I believe he's back in the pastorate, uh, that told a very odd story. He, he said there was a very powerful, influential church member in his church where he pastored that was at odds with him over some particular issue. It had become uh, heated, and they were at, truly at an impasse. And uh, I can't remember all the details that he shared, but it really came down to the fact that one of them, either the pastor, who was my professor, or the church leader, was lying. Like, one of them was lying. And in a very heated argument in the pastor's office after this had been going on and on, one day, the pastor suggested, I'm not recommending we do this, I've never done this, I don't know that I ever will, but the pastor suggested that the only way that they could resolve the problem was for both of them to get on their knees and pray that God would kill the one who was lying. <laughs> and the church member thought that that was stupid and shared something to that effect, but, uh, but the pastor immediately went to his knees and began praying. Uh, you know, one of them was lying, and uh, this was going to destroy the church, and so if the, if the person who lied, he or the leader, wouldn't tell the truth, if God would kill him, and he's praying this. And the church leader couldn't get him to stop praying. He kept telling him to stop that and knock that off. He wouldn't. He just kept praying while the guy was telling him not to. He had choice words, and the leader had choice words, and stormed out. This is all true facts. An hour later, the church leader came back into the church building with his shirt and pants all ripped up. And according to my professor, his face covered in blood and mucus. And he asked the, uh, the pastor if they could bury the hatchet. He, 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 never, he never denied or affirmed what had taken place. He never said what had happened to him. And he never admitted that he was lying. But he did say, can we bury the hatchet? And... He asked him to pray protection over his life. <laughs> While not exactly sharing what in the world had happened in that last hour. <laughs> so those are my two stories. Now where am I going with this? We should be careful when we hear stories like that and we have. You, uh, those are two that I know from a friend, from a, a professor. You probably know things like that. We should be careful not to read too much into these stories. But we should also be careful not to read too little bit. After all, the Lord God reserves the right to make powerful and chilling statements in our lives when He wants to and when He needs to. And God sometimes does. He speaks in startling and in unexpected ways. Especially, it seems, when the holiness of His church is at stake. And we're going to learn about a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, that are going to have a misfortune, awful event to happen to them. I'll, I'll, get, I'll kind of I'll give a spoiler now. They die. <laughs> the, the difference between the scriptures and what happens in your life is that we have divine revelation, divine commentary from God as to why that unfortunate event happened in their life. It's a result of their sin, right? You don't always have that when you don't have that in your life. You don't get divine commentary from God as to say, hey, this difficulty happened in your life, not because you did any sin, but because I just need, you, you, you need to let me pry loose. 
lose some of the things of this world and develop your character. Or, you know what, this is a, this is a direct result of, of that sin. We don't get that kind of commentary. So it's hard for us to make conclusions like that. But in this particular instance, we do. So we are going to learn something today. And here it is. God is jealous for the holiness of his church because he himself is holy. God is jealous. If this doesn't make sense right now, hopefully well, we're done. We have, we, I haven't told the story. God is jealous for the holiness of his church because he himself is holy. In the passage before us today, we're going to see that God made a very powerful and decisive statement about how he views sin and what he thinks of people who put him to the test, and he does so in dramatic fashion. Now, to really understand this passage, we need to begin in chapter 4 to see the contrast, because what chapter 4 and 5 is, is in chapter 4 is a snapshot in a church at its best, and chapter 5 is a snapshot of a church at its worst, in some ways. In some ways, at its best as well, because they handle sin decisively. So, I'm going to give you the contrast, so we're going to begin with verse 4. So, um, would you please stand, if you're able, and we're going to honor the reading of God's Word. We're not going to read all uh, 20 verses now, but I will. we're going to read the end of 4, and uh, then we'll pray, and then we will get started in the content that I want you to see uh, this morning. So, begin in verse 30. It's in, this is in the middle of a health checkup. Snapshot, church is best, and pick up right in the middle. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray together. Before we do, would you repeat after me? God is good. God is good. And he does all things well. He does all things well. His word is true. His word is true. And through it, he will change my life. Through it, he will change my life. Father, we come before you, uh, acknowledging that you are good and you do all things well, that your word, what we are reading today, this is true. This happened. And through your word and through the working of your spirit within us, Father, we, we know and believe that you will change our life. I ask that today you would change our lives. Bless this church. Speak truth into each individual here. May you be glorified and may you be honored. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First thing that I want you to see in this particular section leading up to the next is that uh, we see... Uh, needs were being met by the generosity of other believers. So that's my first point, kind of setting you up and bringing you into some thoughts here. Needs were being met by the generosity of other believers. We just read it, you see. So as a way of reminder uh, of what's going on here, this, is, this was not a communist or socialist setup. It wasn't required to give all you had to be a believer or to connect with the church. There would be some that would look at this, and of course, when you see things that have all things in common, and no one said that what was theirs was their own, uh, you can read that two ways. You can go, oh, see, that's, that's, you know, they just gave it all away, and they don't own anything, and it's the collective group. What, what, they, what it's really saying is, it's yours, it was theirs, but there was just such a willingness to share, it was, it was as if they were holding on to anything. I mean, you need it, they would give it. Um, so this was not a, a socialist setup. Um, uh, you didn't have to give all you had to be a believer. You didn't have to give it all to the church. The, what we learn in the first four chapters, first five chapters, is that there was a willing, from time to time, generosity on behalf of the people. It was willing, they gave willingly, not under compulsion, and it was from time to time. As there was a need, people uh, showed great generosity in meeting the needs. Once again, in that day and age, there, there, uh, there wasn't monetary money, so they could rain down twenties, as we say. It was, it was in crops and lands and animals and, and things. So for them to actually have cash to donate, they would have to sell a field and get money by which to then distribute the needs, um, for needs. And this was a willing, from time to time situation, 
Peter's words of rebuke to Ananias and Sapphira, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to mention this, even communicate this. Remember the two questions he asked? Was not this property, is this not your property to do what you want with? And the answer was, yes. And after you sold it, was it not your money to do what you wanted with? So, so this was not a compulsion, something they had to do. This is something they, they, uh, they were doing, but it was not some expectation that, that the community didn't, uh, that everybody gave all the stuff to the community. And that's very important in this story. That this was not, uh, this was not their dues. The dues to be a part of the Christian church was they gave everything yet. There was an expectation, a willingness, there was a desire for this, um, but it was to be done with joy and not under compulsion. And we learn in verse 34 and 35 that there, that there were people whose needs were being met through the generosity of the body. People with means would sell property and give the proceeds to the apostles, the church leadership, and then they would distribute it to those who had needs. And then in verse 36 and 37, we learn of a very specific example of this generosity. There was a man whose name is Joseph. And he, the Lord lays upon his heart that he has a field he doesn't need or can do without, or maybe he did need. Who knows? And he sells the field and he lays the proceeds at the feet of the apostles, at the church leadership to distribute because maybe he was aware of a need, or maybe he wasn't. The Lord just laid on his heart. We don't know all those details. But we know that he sold a field and gave the proceeds to the church. And he re it was received with so much fanfare from the church that he literally got a nickname. His name is Joseph. But they named him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And so that was like he got a nickname on us. He didn't do it to get a nickname. He didn't do it for the fanfare. That seems clear in the passage. The Lord laid upon his heart. There was a need. God led him to give. He gave. But the result was the church was like, oh my goodness, that's so thankful. Oh my goodness. Hey, you know what? He should, we should call him Joseph. We should call him Barnabas. He's an encourager. Son of encouragement. And so he gets a nickname um, out of this whole deal. Now, so Luke is kind of setting you up. And so we see generosity, we see specifically generosity in a guy named Joseph who gets a nickname, and everybody's like, oh my goodness, he is so, that was so great, thank you. Well, then we see in chapter 5, another couple decides that they want to get in on the action. So let's begin, and, uh, and what I want you to see, point 2 is this, the contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. Although all things seem the same, all things aren't the same. The field is sold, money is, money is received, money is given. Although it seems the same, it's not. Let's begin to read. The contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. Verse 5, chapter 1 4. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So a contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. First of all, their methods were different. Ananias and Sapphira, just like Barnabas, sold, sold land, as, as others did. Barnabas and others. But where they were different is Ananias and Sapphira kept back some of the proceeds of the land. And... Uh, and then they presented it to the church and the apostles as if they had given the full price of the land. They sold the land, they got proceeds, whatever it was. That's not a problem. The problem is that they wanted the church to think they gave it all, when in fact, they didn't. Would it have been, they collectively answer this, would it have been all 
okay if they would have sold the property and said, we're going to give 50% of the proceeds to the church. Would that have been okay, according to what you know about this passage? Absolutely. If they would have wanted to just give 5%, would that have been okay? okay. There might have been some uh, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Judgy Pants in the church that think they should be given more, but uh, they, they could have done it. But the problem was not that they held back money. The problem is that they held back money, but they said that they donated all that they had received. That's where the methods are different. They both sold fields. They both got proceeds. They both gained. The difference is they held back some, but wanted everybody to believe that they, that they gave it all. Their methods were different. Their motives were different. Now, why would they do this? Why, why would they hold back some property, some, some finances, but say that they gave it all? Here's where their motives were different from Barnabas and the rest who had given. They were looking for glory for men. They were seeking praise and name. I, I, think, I, think, I think it's very clear what's going on here. Ananias and and Sapphira are going, oh my goodness, the Barnabas, Joseph just gave money and he got a nickname. We want nicknames. We got we we a feel we can get rid of, too. Look at the way they're treating him. Oh, my goodness. We can, like, be, you know, we can, like, buy favor from the people. They were looking for glory for men. They were seeking praise. They were seeking nicknames. They sought to gain a reputation for great generosity without needing the inconvenience of it. Did you hear that? They wanted the credit and prestige for sacrificial generosity without the inconvenience of the sacrificial generosity. They kept back mis-embezzlement, misappropriation of funds. You say, but it's their property. Absolutely. But the problem is, they, they deliver this money with clarity. Now, if you're with clarity, this is what we got Oh, we're giving it all to the church because we just love the Lord and we want people to be helped. And so their motives were different. It's very clear that Joseph's, Barnabas's motives were to meet a need and glorify God. Their motives were maybe to meet a need, but mostly to glorify themselves. And what we find in verse 3 and 4 is Peter has miraculous ability to know reality. He realizes and pronounces that they had lied to the Holy Spirit. And a little bit later, he's going to say lied to God. Okay. Holy Spirit and God. We see a picture of the Trinity here. The Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus, and God the Father are all God. Lied to the Holy Spirit. You kept back Christ. You had freedom to do whatever you wanted with it, but you devised this plan in your heart. I, I believe in our table talk tonight, we're going to be talking about the role of the heart plays in our actions. And here's a perfect place. If, uh, I just, uh, I'll give you a little uh, uh, give you a little head start if you're looking uh, for some answers tonight. Here's a passage to go to. Because Peter makes it quite clear that where did this sinful action happen? It was devised in their heart. It came, it came from the heart. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, now he's already said the Holy Spirit, but to but to God. Remember what Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. They did not sin against man. They sinned against God. Remember David when he committed uh, adultery, really forced, forced rape on uh, On Uriah's wife, because that's what she's called in the scriptures, right? And uh, Bathsheba. And, uh, and then he covers it up with lies. He covers it up with espionage. He covers it up with, with the death of her husband, Uriah. And, um, and when he's confronted, he comes to grips with his sin. What does he say in Psalm 51 4? Against you, you only have I sinned, and none what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak in blameless, when you judge. So, we see this contrast between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. Third thing I want you to see is in verse 5 through 11. Judgment and death came upon the couple, and a holy fear came upon everyone else. Judgment and death came upon the couple, and a holy fear came upon everyone else. Uh, let's begin reading in verse 5. 
When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. He fell down, she fell down dead. Can I just say it a different way? God killed them. In 1 Peter, Peter writes this in his book, uh, later in life, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15 through 17, he says this, Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but it is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? There's a price to pay for sin. For them, it is death. God just took them in that moment in a dramatic fashion. They lied, and there was no lead up time. There was, they died, fell down dead. And the result was fear fell. Everybody is stunned. They are in awe. They are in shock. They can't believe what they've heard and or seen right before their eyes. Here's our cry. Here's our. A sacrificial gift. We sold it for this much and we gave it all to the church. You liar. Boom. Down dead. So he dies, and then three hours later, as you see in the passage, uh, she, his wife, Sapphira, comes in clueless. She's a clueless of the outcome of what has happened. And uh, she has no idea that judgment has fallen upon her husband. She's questioned. She stays with the, with the plan to get them uh, glory. And and he asked, why have you tested the Holy Spirit? And once again, she fell down dead. They fell down dead in the church. Fear fell upon the church. They were awestruck. They were mesmerized. They had just seen divine judgment from God. And they are they're shocked. They're surprised. And there is a holy reverence for God in this moment. Now, what we see at the end is, is Luke begins to just move past that and show you what the results are of a, of a cleansed church. In uh, verses 12 through 16, our fourth point, God's blessings continue to be poured out on the church. So these, these people die because they sin publicly, uh, testing the Holy Spirit. Fear falls upon the people, and the result is this. Now, many signs and wonders were were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, uh, Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they, they even carried out the sick in the streets and led them on cots and mats, that, uh, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were <coughs> all healed. The result of this cleansing is the church is in holy reverence of God. And God is moving, in verse 12, in mighty ways. And the church continues in fellowship and in worship together. In Solomon's portico. And the people were getting saved, verse 14. And miracles of healing, both healing and wholeness, were happening. The church is cleansed, and the church continues to thrive. Now, I'm going to wrap this up with four questions of application, just to give you a little bit of clarity on this passage. The question I want to first question in application is this: What really was their sin? Well, their sin was deception. It was lying. It was testing God's patience. They thought that they could, they could use a spiritual 
act of worship in a way they would deceive and lie in order to really be worshipped themselves. The problem was under the guise of worshipping God, they sought to be worshipped themselves. They were testing God's patience. They were questioning and disregarding the nature of a holy God. They were robbing Him of glory, seeking praise and applause and accolades. They were not serving for an audience of one. They were serving for an audience of themselves. Mm -hmm. What really was their sin? That's what it was. The second question application as we try to wrap this up. Did God really kill them? Or did they just happen to have a heart attack at that moment? And we just go, oh my goodness, that's kind of like that chandelier or that dude, he got prayed and he just like his clothes are ripped and he's got blood and snot on his face. <laughs> You know, no, 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 this is not a coincidence. This is, we, we, get, we get word from Peter before it happens. You are being, you're being judged. Can I believe you would come into the house of God and in the guise of worshiping God, you would seek to be worshipped through deception and lies. So did God really kill them? Yes, he did. Holiness demands this. Caution, caution, caution. What I'm about to say is caution. Do not assume every difficult thing, I'm going to hit this in the last one, but I want to catch you here as well. Do not assume every difficult thing that happens in your life is a result of sin, but it could be. Don't assume that every bad thing that happens to you is because of sin, but it could be. I mean, it does, I mean, Seriously. So you have a kid who's like smart enough and wagging her finger in your face and telling you what they're going to do, and then they, and defiantly they like turn around, whip around, and smack her into a wall. You just kind of like, okay, there you go. Got that. But you don't know. We don't know. We just don't know. Could it be a result of God punishing you or disciplining you for sin? Maybe, but not automatically. You need to be very careful. But we do have examples. They are one. But they're not the only one. Nathan is another one. Joshua chapter 7, right? God says, don't take the plunder. at I and they do it anyways. And the reside Jericho. And they do it anyways. And then the nation loses the battle of I and Nathan dies. Clearly dies for his sin. Use up in 2 Samuel 6. He touches the ark as it's about to, uh, about to fall off this cart. And he does so to study it. And because he touched, because he is profane, touched what was holy, he, he fell down dead. In the Corinthian Christians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 and 30, it says this, For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Sleep doesn't mean they're at home in bed sleeping. It means they're in the ground sleeping. They die. Wilderness, uh, wilderness Jews, Judge a uh, Jew, chapter uh, Jew, only chapter one, verse five says this. Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. How he's speaking about an event, several events. One of them being when they complained, didn't trust, and yelled at Moses. The ground opened up and swallowed them. And when the ground opens up and swallows you, you die. There are lots of examples of this. This is not the only time. And, sh and should you live in fear of this? I don't think you should live in fear of this. But it's a real possibility that sometimes the difficulties in our life are a result of, our, of God disciplining us for our sin. And other times they're not. And then think about this. If you're going to go, wow. Think about this. Just let me give you an illustration to kind of maybe help with this in your study. Think about when you had a young child in a home. You your grandparent, you're taking your grandkids somewhere, your parent, you remember when you had little toddlers. And you're at somebody's house, or you're at a store, or you're at some event, and they just keep misbehaving. They just keep being bad. They keep doing awful things. They keep playing with knickknacks. They keep attacking the dog. They keep doing whatever they're going to do. They just keep misbehaving, keep misbehaving, keep misbehaving. And eventually, parents, have you ever said this? If you don't straighten up, I'm going to take you home. 
And all God's parents said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you don't stop this, I'm going to take you home. And they don't stop. Can you say it again? If you don't stop this, we're going to take you home. I know you're, you're happy here. This is fun. Grandma always it's happy. You're really happy at your friend's house. You're really happy. But if you, if you don't knock it off, I'm going to take you home. You know, they don't change. They don't change. You say it another time or two. Um, if you don't stop. Eventually, what do you do? You take them home. Oh, you were one of them. You take them. Yeah. You take them home. And then they're like, no, no, we got to do it. It's too late. It's too late. Yeah, too late. Ah, the tears are falling. You got to drag them by their, by their arm or their leg because they're not coming on their own. Right? That's, why, that's why you take them home. You just take them home. And you take them home. I just feel like sometimes that's kind of way. That, does this mean they're not believers? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It looks like the Corinthian believers are because he doesn't. The word sleep is only used of kings who died in faith, who died doing well. They slept. Other kings, when they died, but he was a bad king, he died. So sleep seems to be code word for believer. And so we do at least see an example of somebody. I, I tend to think Achan was probably, or not Achan, Yuzo was probably a believer. I don't, I don't know if this meant that they, that they had divine judgment in hell, but what it does seem like God said, your life is over. On earth, your life is over. And he judged them. What really was their sin? Did God really kill them? Third, fourth question, third question. What is a healthy fear of God? It's, it's a reverential awe. I say it two ways. It is a reverential awe of his holiness and righteousness and perfections and bigness and a little bit a need not be fear of his discipline as well. A reverential awe for his holy character and a need not be fear of his discipline. It's a sense of it's a sense of his presence. It's, it's a, a awareness of his holiness. It is, it, it is a, a, a holy respect for his discipline. Fear of God's discipline can be a deterrent to our sin. The problem is, in the day and age that we live, we've made God all love and no judgment. We leave no, we, we talk about God's love, and in his love we need to no room for his judgment. And the truth is, his love and judgment go hand in hand. They're not at odds with one another. It's his love that, that, that pushed Christ forward as your sacrifice to cover your sin. It's sometimes his discipline that's the most loving thing. You've all been to a grocery store and seen an a child absolutely out of control, way too old, acting way too bad. Six-year-olds ordering their parents around who are saying, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. And we said, he or she's a brat, and you're a bad parent. We've all felt that way, right? Mm -hmm. Not you guys, because you guys are awesome. You don't judge at all. <laughs> but the fact is, God's love and his judgment can go hand in hand. They don't have to be at odds. He is loving, and sometimes the most loving thing a parent can do is bring this, right? Fourth question, fourth question. When is it purging discipline? When is it pruning development? I tend to say that if you really, if you really wrap your heart around it, you'll know. And sometimes it's not about a lesson learned, it's just about God positioning you in your life. Sometimes you don't automatically ask for that. Just surrender your life to Him. Surrender your obedience to Him. And at the end of the day, you don't, I don't, you, you know, I don't know. But do, but do I even need to know? The, the real goal is that I'm putting in the hands of God. I'm going to seek His face and honor Him with my life. And when I'm doing wrong, I move shit back toward obedience to Him. And was it His discipline because I did something wrong? Or was it just Him training my heart? I don't know. At the end of the day, we don't have divine commentary. We don't need to know. Sometimes the why is the absolute wrong question. Well, the best question is, what now and who do I turn to, right? And, of course, the who do I turn to, that's all we've got. Uh, Father, I ask that you would bless this study. That if there's anyone here that's not trusting you as Savior and Lord and has not repented of their sin, realize that they were sinned in need of salvation, in need of your grace.
pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? As we have a hymn of invitation, we talk, talk uh, We give you an opportunity to just let the Holy Spirit speak to you in this moment. You just don't walk out.